let us view a x is equal to b as promised because too long have we dwelt on this a x is equal to 0. Let us see what is the benefit of looking at this or why did we even focus on this. How does this help us in figuring out when a x is equal to b has a solution or not or when it has is the solution unique and so on and so forth. Those important questions. So we know that a recipe for cooking up a simpler looking system of equations is to get to R x is equal to B hat. Now if you have done again a preliminary course on matrix theory, let us say in your undergrad first year courses or wherever you have encountered this sort of thing, you might recall that somebody gave you a condition like you know you have already heard of this rank of a matrix probably. Yeah, here we will define more general notions of rank but nonetheless. So you have already heard about this. So you might recall that somebody told you to check for the rank of A and the rank of A augmented with B. Do you recall something like this? Some condition like this and what was the assertion there? What exactly was the assertion there? So rank of both have to be equal for a solution. What if the ranks are not equal? What do you have? Multiple solutions, no solutions, what? What exactly? Can it be the case? Can you have rank of A more than the rank of? So which one is always greater than or equal to which one? Can this be greater than this? Rank of A more than this? So this rank is less than this. So then what happens? Multiple solutions? Is that multiple solutions? Sure? Yes? No, no, so then, how, so then does, it, does, it, does it really fit in with the case when rank of this is less than rank of this? So I am asking the question when this rank happens to be less than this rank, what is the assertion? Multiple solutions, no solutions, unique solution, what is it? No solutions, right? But let us try to demystify this now based on what we understand. So instead of looking at this, we have already convinced ourselves that it suffices to look at the equivalent condition on the equivalent system of equations, yeah. So let us try to reformulate this condition in terms of the row reduced echelon form versions R and B hat, all right. What does it immediately tell you? What is the rank of A or the rank of R? They are the same. Because it is a definition, right? The rank of A is equal to indeed the number of non zero rows in the row reduced echelon form, and the rank of R is, of course, it is itself its own row reduced echelon form. There is nothing more to do into this, right? So, therefore, the ranks of these two, the row ranks at least, are the same. Let us just say, I mean, for the time being, we will just carry on with this row because we have not yet proved that row rank and column rank are going to be the same. So let us just carry on with this legacy of using the term row rank because we have defined the row rank in that fashion. Now what does it mean when you say that the rank of this fellow got bloated because of the addition of this column? It must mean that when you had this R here, you had a bunch of non-zero rows here and then you had a bunch of zero rows here. So this was R. And when you augmented it by R and B hat, if the rank has to bloat, then indeed what has to happen? You must have at least one more leading one or one more non-zero row. But where can that come from? That non-zero row cannot come from any of these entries here that are already there. So that must come from this R remaining intact as it is 
but that non zero row must be perhaps some singleton here. The moment you have that, what sort of a condition are you trying to meet? You are trying to meet something times 0 is equal to something that is non 0. An absurd proposition, is it not? Do you follow the argument? What I am saying is that when you have bloated, when you have augmented it by b hat, the only way the rank of this fellow increases from this is when the number of non zero rows of this fellow exceeds that of this. The only way the number of non zero rows of this fellow increases from this is if there is a non zero b here, b hat entry here corresponding to which all the other preceding entries are 0. That is the only way to generate a new row in this augmented matrix which happen to be a 0 in the preceding matrix. But that essentially means that you are asking for a condition where something times all the x's and that something is 0 precisely. So 0 times all the x's is equal to something non 0. You can never meet such a condition. So therefore, of course, no solution unless the ranks are <coughs> equal. It is very transparent once you look at the row reduced echelon form. Might not have been so when you look at this, might have been something mystifying. Oh, what is this check and all, right? What is more, you now notice this is not contingent upon having a square matrix A because everything we have done up until this point, this row reduced echelon form, we have not gone via the route of taking an inverse or a determinant or anything of the sort. We have dealt with the general M cross N matrix, so M equations and N variables. So this idea of checking for whether a solution exists or not through this test holds even for rectangular systems and now you know why because it is explicit here in this particular form, right? So this is an important observation that is immediately apparent from what we have claimed so far, right? Next, when you have an underdetermined system, if a solution exists, can it ever be unique? When I say underdetermined systems, fewer number of equations, greater number of variables resulting in an A matrix that is fat. What have we just seen about underdetermined systems? Sorry? There will be free variables and therefore the equation AX is equal to 0 will always have a non-zero solution, right? So suppose for a in m cross n with m being less than n, we have uh, zeta in R n such that A zeta is equal to B, okay? Now, look for xi not equal to 0 such that a xi is equal to 0. Clearly, be very doubtful when you say clearly as I always said, but I hope you are not very suspicious of this because we have explained clearly <coughs> what such a xi exists. Why? We have proved it it is already a fat matrix. So you will have free variables and therefore you will have non-zero vectors psi of course in Rn such that A xi is equal to 0. Now what happens if you for instance take A of zeta plus alpha times xi, what is this going to be equal to? A zeta plus alpha times, where of course let us say alpha is just a scalar, alpha times A xi. What is this? 
this is equal to b because this part is just 0. So therefore this is b. Then what can we say about underdetermined systems of equations? If a solution exists, that solution can never be unique. Either the solution does not exist because of the inconsistency, the possibility that we have seen. But if the solution does exist, you can give up all hopes of having a unique solution. That is not necessarily bad because oftentimes when you conduct fewer experiments than the number of variables you want to determine for whatever be the reasons, maybe the cost of the experiment is prohibitive. You want to determine say a million parameters by performing a hundred experiments. So you will come up with probably 100 equ equations and a million parameters. And you still want to better get a best idea, best case idea about what these parameters ought to be like. You do not want to conduct a million or more experiments, right? Because they may be very costly. So you might have a whole plethora of solutions out of them, which is your best possible solution. When I say best possible, there may be different ways of describing what a best possible solution is. If it is a if it is an optimal path that you are trying to figure out, yeah, based on some polynomials, you might want to optimize certain things and choose the best possible set of solutions from all these infinite solutions that you have. Yeah. If it is some error that you want to minimize, again, some sort of an optimization problem can be cast or posed in that manner. So it is not a bad thing at all. Having non unique solutions in case of these fat matrices is not a bad thing, it is actually a blessing. Yeah, unlike what we have been taught to think about like in mathematics, oh it is a unique solution, it exists, it is unique, that is the best thing. No, in many applications these things may be more desirable because it gives you more room to play around with and figure out what is best for your particular application. Maybe what is best from one particular metric may not be the best from another particular metric, right. So you get a whole playing field to tinker around with these, right. So that is an important observation from this that the solution if it exists is definitely not unique. So next we will try to understand this solution and all this in a bit of a from a bit of a geometric perspective although we will not take it too far because this is a this is slightly you know on slippery slope when you are on this geometric thing and you try to build things on intuition often you run into trouble and that also I will illustrate. But in 2D at least in our plane at least with two variables we understand the geometry of when solutions exist, when they do not and so on and so forth. So there are different ways of viewing this. One is of course you have Ax plus By is equal to alpha Cx plus Dy is equal to beta, right. So when you take this Ax plus By is equal to alpha and you want to sketch this for instance. Let us say it is a point, it is a straight line like this. So you take any two points on this, take any two points on this. Suppose this is x1, y1 and this is x2, y2, right. So you have Ax1 plus B y1 is equal to alpha, a x2 plus b y2 is equal to alpha and you subtract them and what you end up with is a b the vector times x1 minus x2 y1 minus y2 is equal to alpha minus alpha which is 0 even without going into things like inner products and all in two dimensions you understand what this is, right? What is this? It is a dot product. A dot product being 0 means they are orthogonal which means that what is this point x1 minus x2 and y1 minus y2? Is it not the vector that you have drawn like so? Yeah, let me use a different color. So one of those vectors is this x1 minus x2, y1 minus y2. If I am saying that this AB vector is orthogonal to this vector, what must be its direction? Perpendicular to that line, right? So this is the direction 
a b maybe not I should write it like this. In other words the coefficients are always giving me the normals and what is the right hand side giving me this alpha? It is a bias. I mean if I play around with this alpha I will be moving this line parallel to this existing line. So in other words every equation can be viewed as a bunch of numbers which constitute the normal and a bias. So these are all so called hyperplanes right. Every equation corresponds to a hyperplane and every hyperplane let us give it this name is described by described by a normal and a bias that is it. So essentially every constraint being imposed on your system of linear equations if you view it in the Euclidean space it is basically every time I am giving you a new set of normal and bias and saying that you have to adhere to this you have to meet this constraint that whatever points you are giving me they must satisfy this normal bias constraint right every time I am giving you a new hi. So essentially the solution must be in the intersection of all these hi's yeah that is the solution for you that is a geometric interpretation but there is a risk of going too far with this you see in 2D you might think oh hang on I know exactly when the solution does not exist when you have the same normal but different biases in two equations the twain shall never meet and therefore you have no solution right. So you might think okay in 3D it is the same thing this does not look like a plane we call it a hyperplane but in 3D it actually looks like a plane. So let us say you have a plane like so and you cook up another plane which is parallel to it and you might think yeah I know I know exactly that is the so that must be it that is the reason why I do not have a solution when I have three equations and three variables must be those two planes they have messed up they have different biases but hang on let us look at a situation like this okay let me not draw the thing let me just try to draw the figure again suppose you have something like this yeah okay again yeah it is like putting three cards together you see three planes no two of them are parallel to each other do you think this is going to have a solution pairwise there is always a line over which you can have a solution but when you put them like that together there is no one single point in this whole space which satisfies all three of them together. So do not get too carried away with intuitions that you build in lower dimensional spaces I know this goes counter to what I said when, when we talked about that ant problem right but you should also know that that is the reason why we try to do a bit of algebra we do not always want to rely on things you see already in 3D this is messing up and 4D we cannot even visualize right so that is why we want an algebraic structure. So although it is good to have a geometric inside every once in a while let us not be over reliant on that geometry but rather trust what we do algebraically right which is why we need to understand things like dimensions and other things other notions which we use so freely and so loosely speaking in a much more formal structure right. So therefore what we are now going to start what we have done up until now is rather you know free flowing maybe you figured that this is just viewing the usual things in new light which may be interesting but it is okay it is kind of like everything that someone understands I mean something that everyone understands. Now what we are going to try and see is a little more formalism introduced. We have already seen how to go about the business of finding solutions using this row reduced echelon form. We would like to know the limitations of that method. Any half decent scientific method should tell you not just its merits but also the limits of its usage. 
If you don't do that, don't trust it. It's proselytizing, it's not science. So when we are doing this rho reduced echelon form, we should also know where we cannot push it beyond a certain point. Hmm? What are the operations that we carried out when getting to this rho reduced echelon form? Of course, you'll say matrix multiplications. What do those matrix multiplications imply? See, we had to divide numbers, we had to add numbers, we had to multiply numbers. But these operations do not necessarily have to be the way we have viewed them since our childhood. For instance, and this is where algebra comes in. When I say root 3, what do you think? 1.732 and some nasty decimals thereafter, which are non-recurring, right? But now, let's say I define the operations in a different way. Suppose I have a set of numbers. Instead of giving you all the numbers to play around with, I give you the following. 1, 2, so 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Suppose this is the set of numbers. That's all you have. You've actually done something similar when you dealt with binary arithmetic. You just had zeros and ones. But I'm giving you something more. I'm giving you seven of these objects. And I'm defining the addition operation in a special manner. I'm saying that for A, B belonging to S, I define A plus B, this is my addition now, as A plus B modulo 7. How many of you have heard of modulo operations? Okay, most of you, but still I'll then repeat it for those who are not familiar. Modulo essentially means you add them Divide them by the number, 7 here in this case, take the remainder. So of course, if you take any two numbers here, there's a chance that the number might be more than 7. If you take 1 and 2, it's just 3. You divide 3 by 7, it's 0 times 7 plus 3. So 3 is the remainder. Hmm. But if you, are, if you take 5 and 6, it's 5 plus 6, that's 11. Divided by 7, that's 7 times 1 plus 4. So 4 is the answer because 4 is the remainder, right? That is how it's defined. And by the same token, we define the multiplication also in this manner, A multiplied by B modulo 7, okay? Now, what do you think does root 3 mean in this case? Is it 1.73? doesn't make sense. 1.73 to whatever real number you have in mind isn't even part of this number system. Does it mean root 3 doesn't exist? Maybe, I don't know, I haven't checked. But if it does exist, what is it? What should I be looking for if I want to solve for root 3? I should be looking for a number which when multiplied by itself in the sense of this operation that I have now defined, not the conventional. Get everything you've learned. So the way to learn about this is unlearn everything you've learned up until this point. Just focus on the operations that I have defined. Don't have any baggage carried from the past, just go for these operations and figure out if any of these numbers multiplied by itself leads to 3, then that is a square root of 3, right? So let's check 1 squared is 1, 2 squared is 4, yeah, 3 squared is 9, 9 modulo 7 is 2, 4 squared is 16, 16 modulo 7 is again 2, 5 squared is 25, 25 modulo 7 is 4. 6 squared is 36, that's 1. So in this number system, unfortunately, however, you might have already noticed if I had set instead to find out square root of 2, did I have anything there? What was it? Right. So when you see weird things like square root of 2 is equal to 3, be not alarmed because it might be that the operations have been cooked up in a wicked fashion to trick you. So you have to keep your minds open to these possibilities. That is why we do algebra. Because the trick that you have learned incidentally of taking inverses and all are not just applicable for the conventional number system where you know real numbers, but also for other different types of number systems, which together constitute what we define as fields, okay? So we need to understand what are fields in order to understand where we can apply those tricks and techniques that we have learned about row reduced echelon forms and where we cannot, okay? So let's, 
Yes. So you, it's a, it's a, it's a, this was what we call, we'll see later, what we call a finite field. So you can keep checking over this. So yeah, it's not necessarily an easy problem. Here we had very small, rather finite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There were seven of them. But yeah. it's like. Yeah, it's, it's not easy. I never said it's easy. I just told you what the principle should be, what you should be actually looking for. So you should not by default assume. The point I made was you should not by default assume that square root of 3 is 1.732, square root of 2 is 1.414, and so on. So we will not get into that here. Those, those will be like, you know, getting into efficient algorithms to do that. Those are not, uh, those are not part of this sort of a course. Yeah, well, I'm just trying to get you introduced to the idea of doing abstract, abstract kind of operations here. Yeah, and what those symbols mean. So that square root symbol, what it means is that you have a number multiplied a certain number of times, twice precisely with itself to yield a, another number, subject to the operation that has been defined. So for that, first we have to understand, maybe it's better if you understand, what is a group, okay? So again, I'm going to keep it semi-formal if there is something like that. So we have a set, S, yeah, with some operation. How should I denote it? Let's call it just a plus. It's not just an addition, okay? It's just any operation. So this is a set. And this is a binary operation. Binary operation means I take two elements from the set at a time and I get them to operate under this, okay? So a binary operation, okay? So there's a set, there's a binary operation. This is said to be a group if it satisfies the following. What is the first thing? It's got a name, it's called closure, which means for all A, B belonging to S, A plus B also belongs to S. If I pluck out any two members from that set and pass them through that operation, what results, yeah, should also belong to that set, yeah. Second is a property, again, you're familiar with, is associativity. which is when we say that for all A, B, C coming from the set S, it doesn't matter in which order you do the operation. It's all the same so that actually you can get rid of the bracket and be unambiguous about it, okay? So you have the proper of property of closure, you have the property of associativity. Third, you have the property of existence of unique identity, okay? What it means is there exists a unique, this is the symbol, there exists a unique. So remember, I'm just using the symbol zero as a placeholder. This is not the number zero. Yeah, unfortunately, we ran out of better symbols, so we call it zero. But it is the identity element because I've denoted the symbol as addition, so I've used the additive identity as we understand in case of numbers. But this is just the identity element such that for all A in this set S, we have A plus zero is equal to A. So when you take this identity element, get it to act or perform the binary operation with any member of that set, what you get back is the original member, okay? Operation with the identity has no effect, no change. It remains identical with what it was. The fourth, existence of an inverse. What it means is, for all A belonging to S, there exists a unique minus A. Again, this minus should not be read as the negative of the number essentially. It's just a placeholder, a symbol, such that A 
plus minus a gives you back the additive identity or in this case of course we have not said addi addition yet the identity okay. If these four properties are held together we call such a set with this operation to form a group. In fact there are things called Cayley tables if you are interested you can look them up maybe we will have the occasion to drop one or two in this course. Cayley tables which basically describe for finite number of elements in a set with an operation they actually tell you what happens when you take them two at a time and what the resultant is. I so 0 plus a is the same as a is that a part of the condition or is it a we have not talked about commutativity yes, yet. So, so, so Sorry? In that case you will have, have to impose that condition you will have to impose that condition. So, so this and 0 plus a equal to a right? Yeah. yeah. And same for inverse? So yeah same for inverse you will have to impose it a priori because you have not yet talked about commutativity. I will come to commutativity and then I will use it with a different color and talk about this. So that is the reason why I held it back. Okay, we need to add. Yes, we will revisit it with the white chalk again, but before that we will just write something else with a yellow chalk and it gets a different name. Yes. Yes, this is the same, yeah, to, but this inverse is not the same for every element. For given element the inverse is unique. Yeah, so do not go about thinking oh every element will have the same inverse, no of course not. But given that you have one element then there is a unique inverse, you cannot have multiple elements which serve as the inverse of a particular element. That is what this uniqueness means. So there is uniqueness in both the cases but this is one size that fits all. This is the identity that works for everyone but the inverse does not work for everyone. For everyone there is one inverse, this uniqueness just means that. In addition if you have a fifth property fifth property that for all a b belonging to this set a s sorry a plus b is equal to b plus a which is the property of commutativity all right. Then it is not just a group but what we call an abelian group. And then as your friend has just pointed out because this commutativity is something that has to be imposed. So in order to have it in the definition itself here we will have to impose this here and okay. If we do not impose it in the definition it is not implied automatically unless it is an abelian group in which case it does not matter in which order you are carrying out the operation. So this is an abelian group with respect to one operation. In the next lecture we shall build on this and we shall see that instead of considering a set with just one operation we will consider a set with two operations and we will see what sort of structures we impose based on these two operations and in combinations with these two operations we will have other properties such as distributivity pop up when we consider both of those operations together yeah and we will have structures that we call as rings with identity then subsequently integral domains and fields and so on and so forth and then we shall see that fields are exactly the objects we want to concern ourselves with because it is exactly when you are dealing with fields that everything we have carried out in total for solving the system of equations ax is equal to b can be replicated. We will also see some interesting features and properties of fields maybe particularly with finite fields but we shall not go into full detail of an algebra course which if you are interested you can go through a preliminary book by I mean preliminary course based on a book by Michael Artin on algebra okay. Thank you. <coughs>